Hi, my name is Rebecca. I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist, and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower card catfishes. So today I'm going to, because one of my interests is fish food, and I'm going to review different foods and talk about their ingredients, uh, what the fishes they cater for, and basically whether they're whether you should really feed them to your fishes or in what case should you feed them to your fishes so I'm going to start with my favourite so this is Rapashi Soylent Green and Rapashi is a great brand anyway but I'm going to start with their Soylent Green products so this is mainly focused as it says on off-witch feeders so these are fishes that feed mostly on periplankton algae, bacteria, items like that and there is another product called Super Green that you'll see available which is the same but has up to 80% algae within its um, products where this has less but I don't exactly know how many I only know that 80% because I emailed um, Alan Rapashi regarding it but the great thing about this is even though it might not contain as many algae you can um, add algal powders from health food stores to this product to bulk it out with higher volumes of algae and if you can find a wider diversity of um, algae so what fishes would I feed this to? so this would be largely towards those algivorous lower codes so anything like barium cistrus, ketostoma so it's like gold nuggets, uh, mangoes, ketostoma rubber nose, bulldog plecos, even autosynclus so a lot of lower cards and the amount of algae I add will depend on the uh, actual lower card I'm feeding because some might eat a lot less. This does contain um, black a black soldier fly larvae and where is it krill meal to lower contents than other brands. So if I was feeding something maybe towards the more omnivorous side, I wouldn't add those extra algae in. So why is it great? It has a diversity of algae and a high volume of algae, but not just that, fishes are really willing to feed onto it. So you don't have that sort of lag of them actually weaning onto this diet. They don't need um, time often to wean onto it. I would only feed, if they're not an algivore and they're more carnivorous, I wouldn't feed this. You could bulk it out with other like frozen foods, I guess if they're more omnivorous. But it would even work for fishes like discus. The only issue with discus is they're not a big fan of gel foods. They want either to stick to the surface or kind of move around a little bit. Uh, it might also be a colour aspect. But there's so many fishes that would naturally feed on this sort of thing. Um, Hillstream loaches as well. So very few diets have that wide range of algae and that high volume of algae so when i say a gel diet it is literally like a jelly um or similar to gelatin it doesn't contain gelatin and it doesn't contain agar it does have algae in but the gelling agents are very different so i'll go through the ingredients in a bit because i think that's the most important thing when it comes to feeding fishes and there's several ways you can feed it largely most people use it as a gel mix in the water let it go in set it will um mix of wa boiling water let it set then go in the tank you can store it in the fridge i find for up to a week it can grow a few bacteria and i don't know what bacteria they are so i wouldn't keep it longer than that you can also dehydrate it and dry it to make it into a jerky but a lot of the fishes that you would normally be feeding it as a jerky wouldn't really touch it in that context um that would feed on it as a gel wouldn't really touch in that context but that sort of thing would be better if you're feeding something like african cichlid so i'll go through the ingredients in a second so yes so although it's got um Cichlid, don't always look at the fishes on the front to what to feed the thing and this really depends a lot of people focus really solely on whether it says it's algae based you really got to look at these ingredients so this is the ingredient list of Apache Soylent Green so I'm using the actual bottle here um, just because it might be easier than and sorry if this is really small 
So it contains, you can see spirulina, algae here, and also algae meal, which is Corellia, which are the sort of most easily accessible and cheapest algae to get in the aquarium trade, um, or aquarium hobby, or just the health food in general. So these are the main ingredients. At the front shows that there's the highest volume. This is a cyanobacteria, still an algae I'd count it. And some people will say law cards and um, fishes don't feed on a high volume of cyanobacteria. They do, and it's in many of their gut records. Um, you can't prove any other further than that, really. So the next ingredient we have here, obviously, so this is the next algae. I don't know if this is a cyanobacteria, but it is one of those on microalgae. So in studies using Ancestra, so that's bristle noses, when feeding high volumes of just one species of algae, it did just as well as feeding a complete prepared diet in uh, growth, colour, um, stuff like that. So this is where I'm not as much of a fan of it and it, the reason I use this over super green is the fishes don't seem as keen on feeding on super green so I add even more algae to this and then they still feed on those extra algae they're not as fussy after that. So there's krill meal, so this is where because it's all fruit uh, rather than just being extreme sort of algivore there, um, there is the more carnivorous side to it so that is krill meal. Uh, let me just so that krill meal is more to cater for that more carnivorous side of um, uh, old fruit feeders which many only feed on I think what is compared to a very small amount of invertebrates. Pea protein is a protein source. We've got black, so black soldier fly larvae which I think is actually would be better to add that instead of the krill meal but it could be worse. And the fishes really feed on this, especially when it comes to weaning them from captivity, straight after import, especially if they're really skinny. So what have we got? Uh, rice proteins. So these are sort of uh, what to be vegetable protein. So upping that so sort of protein content without using fish. The only issue is is that these sort of carnivorous proteins might not be as accessible as algal proteins. Um, and also that would be the same with the plant proteins, whether they are accessible for um, algivores who specialise in algae, not land plants or similar, whether they can access as much nutrients and fish meal, they potentially really can't access as much nutrients. You've got alfalfa, brewer's yeast. Um, brewer's yeast actually does have a really good nutritional um, like use, so it's not just there for the sake of it. Coconut meal. And then we get a few more algaes later down. So these, I assume, are the more um, expensive algae. So that's a schister, schistotrum algae. And then we've got dried seaweed meal, which is really vague. What seaweed is that? We don't know. But it's still worth adding and it's worth having. Lichen, that's a, a gelling agent. Locust bean gum, that's another gelling agent. And people complain about gelling agents, or as people will say, fillers, all the time. The thing is, is these aren't exactly fillers because they provide your purpose. You don't want that food just breaking down in the aquarium straight away before the fish can even feed to it. And the good thing about Rapashi compared to other gel diets is it does um, break down much slower. So it can last, I find, up to like, 24 hours or more so you don't need to worry about um, it breaking down. We've got some other things, uh, taurine, stingy nettles, garlic, so these are really the herbal things that do have a benefit. Garlic tends to be I think more of a flavour and getting fish feeding. Then we've got dried kelp, uh, dried watermelon, so these are some kind of adding up the ingredients and a lot of people might complain that a lot of ingredients doesn't mean that it's were um, a good diet. The problem is is that a range of ingredients might actually be increasing the range of nutrition and the range of vitamins and minerals which you can see are added in here. You need a lot of these. Magnesium, um, different amino acids, uh, where is it, the different vitamins, 
uh, biotin, folic acid. We don't really, oh, vitamin B12, which you might not find in all insects that are used. And so the problem is that we don't actually know the nutritional profile of different fishes, so that does make it a little bit tricky. But all of these are useful. Um, the main thing is, I'd say, for alcohols, you're wanting a lot more algae. So that's where adding them in really matters. You can mix it with other, I guess, algal gel dyes. If you want kind of a mix between the two, maybe adding in that super green, but I find fishes aren't as keen on super green as they are in uh, soylent green. So that's why I use this over super green because there's no point feeding something if the fishes aren't ever gonna eat it. So this, loads of really good ingredients anyway and a lot of people might focus on this this means very little protein protein is really vague what is a protein well it's many things amino acids there's so many different amino acids you could almost have a protein like with only like very few amino acids you want that range of amino acids and there's some that you don't want as much of. So really it doesn't matter the percentage of protein, it matters also the source of the protein. Different sources of protein have different um, abilities to be accessible by different fishes. So if a fish is an algivore, it's less likely to be able to extract the protein from the krill meal, the pea protein, the soldier fly. It also does depend on how it's been prepared. Then a lot of one that people get worked up on fibre. Fibre is really difficult because it depends on the fish. Um, and it's used very differently in fishes to how it's used in other organisms. Moisture, you don't want the food breaking down in the pot too quickly anyway. But this one, ash max. So people are looking at ash maximum and thinking that foods are adding directly ash in. This is not added into the diet. This is a measure of the mineral content, so the direct minerals that can't be burnt away in this diet. So this is like the mineral content, which is 12%. Uh, it's difficult to say if it's high or not, so let me, uh, just looking at uh, Tetra, they haven't actually listed theirs it seems um different brands list different things and i don't know if it's what is the legal requirement i don't think there is one for fishes to list uh, that max ash it's just sort of openness but there's so many different useful ingredients and definitely if you're feeding alcohols add different alcohol powders it bulks it out it makes it cost less and you could get from like health food stores um the spirulina powder and the Corella, definitely. It's just so much cheaper. I buy it from Amazon. I think last time I bought it from Amazon, maybe it was 20 quid a kilo. So definitely look at that and you can bulk out many other diets. So why is Rapashi Sonic Green the one I use most? It caters for the ingredients, the best that I can get in the UK. And I'm going to try it out new life spectrum there is no other uh, there's only one other product that contains a high range of algae and a high volume of algae why is it focusing on my fingers don't here we go um that contains a high volume of algae and a high range of algae and the fishes really feed on it there's no fish that is an algivore that I haven't managed to won't, well won't feed on it almost straight away so by far, I recommend this for algivores and bulking it out with different ingredients. And there's a whole range of things you can get from health food stores anyway. So, that's my review of Rapashi Sonic Green and how using these sort of like ideas, you can look at other fish foods and identify which fish foods are best. So anyway. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe and goodbye.